object-oriented programming. I, and I don't know what your perspective and your thoughts are on whether you like writing object-oriented programs or you prefer writing procedural programs. But in general, the move in computing and programming is moving away from procedural programming to object-oriented programming because it is considered a superior way of crafting our, our code. And I'll talk about why that is in, in just a moment here. But it has to do with the fact that we can partition code in blocks that more easily support maintenance and reuse and things of that sort. You know, if you think about what happens in a typical procedural program, we might define some types, perhaps local to the program, and then after we define types, we might create some data objects, variables and such that we're going to use in our program. And then we write some code that manipulates those data types or and manipulates those data objects to accomplish something of, of utility. But when you really study it out, what you have here is a lot of things that are related to one another, but they're all kind of mixed together in, in one jumble. The idea behind object-oriented programming is instead of having our program just be a collection of things that are related to one another in the context of this program, we, we have the data objects and then the code that manipulates and works with those data objects gets bundled together. And that particular bundle then could be reused from program to program to program. So instead of the data objects and the code being separate from one another, now we, we put them together. And so now a program becomes a collection of data objects and related code that all exist together. And these bundles can be much more easily mixed and matched and manipulated over time. It kind of goes back to the premise that we like to think that what we do is software engineering, but yet a lot of software development works very, very different than engineering in other contexts. An electrical engineer doesn't sit down at a workbench with a bunch of metal and a soldering iron and say, okay, I'm gonna create a radio from scratch. An electrical engineer sits down with a bunch of pre-made electrical components, capacitors, resistors, other things, and wires those together in a way to accomplish what it is he or she is trying to create. We're not starting from scratch every time. But too often in software development, every time we create something, we start from scratch. And that therefore makes our code much more error prone. It makes our time to develop things much longer. Whereas in other types of engineering, you're not starting from scratch every time. You're using a lot of known good components and putting them together perhaps in a new way to accomplish your intent. Well, the idea behind object-oriented programming is for us to be able to, in an organization, in a development environment, create a library of objects that we can then reuse over and over and over again in different contexts and know what those things are going to do and know that they are, in fact, correct and will deliver certain functionality to us. So ABOB gives us the ability to work with objects. Um, I like to say when describing ABOB as a programming language in general, that it's kind of like a mixture between COBOL, which is an old language that probably none of you have ever written in before, and, and Java. Because it's COBOL-like, because it's so verbose and has so many keywords, and you can sit down and read through a program and uh, kind of understand what it's doing, even if you don't know that programming language because of all the keywords and and just how literal the language is. It's like Java because of its support for object-oriented programming. And so a lot of the concepts that um, are deployed in object-oriented ABAP are very similar to those 
that you see in other languages like C++ and Java. Now what's different about ABAP as opposed to Java, for example, is you can't really write a procedural Java program. Every Java program is going to have to have at least one class that you are going to have to write because at minimum you're going to need that to encapsulate the main logic of your program. But you can write procedural ABOP and you can write object-oriented ABOP. And so in fact we could write a program that mixes those two things together. And you see this in languages like PHP, for example. You could have a few objects that you develop and then you could use them in the context of your procedural coding and just leverage them where they would be relevant. And so you see a lot of that kind of hybrid use of object-oriented ABOP or ABOP objects in, in different development techniques. Now there are some language constructs which are considered deprecated and, and we have tried to avoid them and I've tried to point them out to you when I said, you know, you can do it this way but don't do it this way. But what's very interesting is, and we talked about this at the very beginning of the semester, when SAP introduces new language to the ABAP language, they always want to preserve backwards compatibility. So they never actually turn off anything, if you will. You can always run old ABAP code. But when they move to ABAP objects, they realize that some of those older techniques just really didn't work in the context of ABAP objects. So whereas in procedural ABAP, everything is always backwards compatible, in ABAP objects, you may actually find that if you use code that is deprecated, you get an error message that says, cannot use this in object-oriented context. So if you've written your code correctly to this point this semester, you may never see any kind of warning or indication about this, but you will see perhaps um, some indication in some techniques that you're trying to do things that are in fact no longer allowed. Just as in other object-oriented languages, uh, we will see that ABAP object supports inheritance, so we can build a tree-type structure of objects where one class inherits behaviors and, and uh, structures from another class. We certainly won't get to that today, but as we uh, continue throughout our discussion, that's something that we will talk about. Um, ABAP object supports polymorphism, which is the idea that different but related objects all have the same communication interface. What I like to use as an example of this is from the real world. You rent a car that you've never driven before and you get into the driver's seat and you already know pretty much how to operate it. You know how the steering wheel works, you know how the brake works, you know how the accelerator pedal works because every car basically works on that same principle. You communicate with the car in the same way. Now, maybe you've had the experience of you get into a friend's car or a rental car and you can't figure out how to turn the windshield wipers on because sometimes those controls are different and you, know, you might have to go hunting for them. But basically, the idea is if you've driven one car, for the most part, you can drive a wide variety of other kinds of cars. And you could even drive things that are car-like, like a tractor or a steamroller or something of that sort. The interface to operate that equipment is the same, even though it's fundamentally different objects. And so ABAP does support polymorphism. We have events, which we will not get to today, um, but we have not really talked about event-oriented programming in Java quite yet, uh, but we will as we continue our discussion here. The idea behind ABAP events is you can basically structure your program so that it waits for the user to do certain things, and then when the user clicks on something or does a particular action, the appropriate object responds to that action and employs logic, creates output, or whatever it is that might be necessary based on the action that the user has taken.
So we will work with inheritance, we'll work with polymorphism, we'll work with events, all of that in the context of our ABAP work. And it is not my intent to kind of teach you object-oriented programming from the ground up, but this may be a good review for you of some coding techniques that perhaps you have not used in, in quite some time. Well, everything in object-oriented programming, whether we're talking about ABAP or other programming languages, begins with the concept of a class. A class is a definition of the structure and functionality of what will ultimately be an object in your program. I, I like to think of a class as like an object blueprint. You can create a blueprint for a building, but that blueprint is obviously not the building. You have to then go out and actually build the building reflective of the particular blueprint that has been created. Well, so too with a class. A class is going to define the structure of what will be an object, but it's actually not an object until you create one or more of them in the context of, of your program. The class is going to define um, the data the object will contain and the related functionality. So like what I put on the board, you can think of an object as ultimately being a, a set of data objects that are very closely related to one another and the code needed to operate or manipulate those data objects. We use the fairly traditional terminology in ABAP of talking about attributes of a class and methods of a class and so we will see that in our coding. Now, one of the things that ABAP does that may be a little bit different from your experience in other languages is an ABAP class divides itself into two different pieces. So if you will, it's not a single blueprint. It's a blueprint that exists in two different parts. We have the class definition which contains the attribute declarations, it contains things like type definitions if those are needed, and it defines the interface to our methods. When I use the term interface, I'm talking about it defines parameter passing, data being passed to and received back from a particular method. So we have the definition of a class, and then we have the implementation of the class. And the implementation of the class is simply the code that makes up the guts of the, of the methods. So we have one part of the class that indicates what the parameter passing are to the various methods, what methods exist, and then we have the implementation that actually gives the code that goes with the method. So what we are going to see in every object-oriented program is, is two distinct blocks. We have the keyword class, and then we have the name of the class that we are going to create, and then we have the keyword definition, and then obviously there's going to be something that exists in the guts of this definition, but then that block will end with the end class statement, and then we have the class implementation. So uh, let's go to our ABOP editor and, and let's start writing some code here, okay? And this is going to be ABOP objects code. And so um, I'm going to do a pretty typical example that's often used for creating a first object, which is let's create a class modeling a vehicle. I used a car as an example a moment ago, so let's just stick with that example. So we would have class vehicle definition, and then there would be some code here, which obviously I'm not going to put in at the moment, but we would see an end class statement, and then I would have a class vehicle implementation, end class, and we have now written our first ABOP objects program, okay? Uh, I'm pretty sure that this will pass syntax check. Yep, it did. Um, if I run it, it does absolutely nothing, of course, but you will see this structure in all of your ABOP objects programs that you create. Now, I may in fact have multiple classes defined, 
in which case I would have two blocks for every piece of this um, that is needed. Now you can create your classes locally or you can create them globally, just like we have done to this point with types, for example. Um, and just like we did with types, we'll start out with creating them in the context of just our program, and then I'll show you how to create these in the ABOB dictionary. But in fact, if we go back to the ABOB dictionary, which I think I still have open in this window, you'll notice that there's no item here for define a class. You know, we have database, table, we have data types, we have, we have all kinds of different things here, but there's no class. And in fact, if you said, well, a class is kind of like a data type, well, when I click create here, um, you'll notice it's, it's not like it gives me the choice here of creating a class. So although it still is going into the ABOP dictionary, we have a specialized transaction just for building classes, which is transaction SE24, which is called the class builder, okay? So we will eventually wind up here, but what the class builder allows us to do is create the definition of a class using a set of screens that in some respects looks very similar to work that you have already done when you've created domains and database tables and things of that sort. So if we can write the code to create it locally in our program, creating it in the class builder is, is pretty trivial at that point. And there's actually a way that we can reuse a lot of our code in the context of the class builder. And I'll show you that. I'm gonna guess it'll probably be about a week from now before we get to that. So in the context of ABOP objects, we have classes. And then, of course, we have the objects, which we will create in our program that are actually an instantiation of a class. The, the parallel here is a class is very similar to a type in that you define the type and you describe the type, but you haven't actually created a data object until you pair it with a data statement. Well, the same thing is going to be true here. We, and I, I always like to say we define a class, but understand when I say that I mean we create both the definition and the implementation. We define the class, and then in a given program, we instantiate perhaps one or more objects of that particular class. So let's start getting into the details here. Some of this is going to be pretty straightforward. There are a few places where there are some wrinkles. But I think ultimately you should find a lot of this to be pretty understandable. I did get a kick out of your textbook though. Your textbook covers ABOP objects in like 25 pages. And it's like the most compressed presentation of ABOP objects I've ever seen. It's like what we're gonna talk about for like a whole class period, maybe like one and a half pages in your book because they just throw a lot of facts at you without a lot of explanation. I think you'll find that after we cover this in class, if you go back and look at your textbook, it's a really great reference. But if you read through that whole chapter and were left scratching your head, I think it's pretty understandable because they really do uh, progress through the material very, very quickly. So let's talk about the definition of a class. In a class definition, you may see the following things you may see types definitions, which of course would be types that exist only in the context of this particular class. We may see constants created. We may see data objects created. And really both constants and data objects would be examples of attributes of a particular class. The only distinction is that a constant would be an attribute whose value never changes whereas other data objects would be changeable. And then we see the methods that are going to be a part of this class, but really all we're going to see in the definition is the name of the method and its interface. And remember, whenever we use that word interface in this context, we're talking about the parameter passing. Now, all of the items that we just talked about actually have three visibility modifiers, only two of which, though, we will talk about at this juncture. 
items can be designated as public, which means that if they're designated as public, they can be seen by every other object and every other portion of our program. Whereas things that are designated as private can only be seen by and only manipulated by the object itself. And once again, I'm going to make the assumption that this is not a new concept for you, but perhaps it is something that you haven't worked with in a while. And ABAP is going to add something new to the wrinkle, uh, a new wrinkle to this that I'm not aware of any other object-oriented languages that uh, support this, although maybe some of you are well aware, are aware of some, and I'd like to I'd like to learn about those. But you probably in other programming classes where I've talked about the big distinction between public and private is it allows a class or an object to protect itself, or it allows us a, a um, modicum of security, and that we can have attributes and no external entity can modify those attributes directly, it has to ask the object to modify the attributes for them. And the idea might be something like this. We could define a vehicle, and one of the attributes of our vehicle could be the number of wheels the vehicle might have. Well, if we're writing just a generic vehicle class, it would make sense for a vehicle to be able to have four tires car has four tires, lots of different kinds of vehicles have four tires. Would it make sense for a vehicle to have three tires? Well, sure. You have those uh, trike motorcycles, you have tricycles that little kids drive. There are all kinds of different three-wheeled vehicles. Two-wheeled vehicles, because you have a two-wheeled vehicle. Yes, um, you, bicycle would be the obvious example, motorcycle, two-wheeled vehicles. Could you have a one-wheeled vehicle? Absolutely. A unicycle is a kind of vehicle. It has one wheel. Could you have a zero-wheeled vehicle? Well, now you kind of get into kind of a metaphysical discussion, I suppose, as to what is a vehicle and, you know, could it be a vehicle with like a hoverboard with no wheels? Would that be a vehicle? Well, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I think we would all agree that it would not make sense to say that a vehicle has negative three tires, okay? It has to be a positive number, and it may or may not be zero. And you know, you could go up, could a vehicle have 16 wheels? Sure, you know, you could have semi-trucks. Could you have a vehicle that has 150 wheels? You know, maybe. But like I said, I don't know that there's any way that we could have a vehicle with negative five wheels. So if we were defining a vehicle class, and we had a data object or an attribute that defined the number of wheels that this particular vehicle had, we wouldn't want it to ever be set to a negative number. Well, the way we can make sure that that never happens is we can declare that particular attribute to be private so that no one other than us in the context of this object can change the value, and then when we change it, we can employ logic to make sure it only gets set to a reasonable number. And that's the way this would play out in most object-oriented programming languages. But ABOB gives us something very interesting. ABOB gives us the ability to create an attribute and make it public, but make it read-only. Now, in most programming languages that are object-oriented, you're familiar with, I, I'm guessing, even if you've never used these terms before, um, what are called accessor and mutator functions. More colloquially, these are getters and setters. Okay? And, and you probably have written object-oriented programs before where if we stick with my example, my vehicle class might have an attribute called number of tires. And so I might have a method called get number of tires and another method called set number of tires. And that's designed to enforce my security model. Well, what ABUB does is it says, that's kind of tedious. And I get, no pun intended, why you might want to employ a setter method to say, okay, 
you, in order to set a new value, you're going to have to call my method. But writing getter methods for the most part is an exercise in just annoying code writing. And in fact, in a lot of development environments, the system could automatically generate getters for you. Well, ABOP says, we don't really need getters. We can take an attribute and just make it public so that everyone can see it, but to give us security to make sure no one else can manipulate it, we can make it read only. So what we will commonly see in ABOP objects is we don't need getter or accessor methods. We just make an attribute to be read only and then write mutator or setter methods to control just changing the value. And so that's kind of a nice feature that, like I said, I, I'm not aware of any other object-oriented language that does that, but I would think this is something that they really should think about copying because it's a pretty nice feature. So within the class definition, which is what we're talking about at the moment, we talked about there being a public section and a private section. Order is important. The public section comes first, and then we have the private section. So our code winds up looking something like this. Class, example class definition, and then the keywords public section, period. And then if we want to create types, we have a type statement, just like we've already seen this semester. If we want to create constants, we have a constants uh, section. If we want to create data objects, this would be our, our attributes. We have a data statement. So, And you'll notice I've given you an example here, data, name of the attribute, type, type. And then if we want to make it read only, we just put read only at the end of that particular data statement. Notice it's read dash only. So what we will commonly see is a public section that looks like this and then a private section that immediately follows it. So let's do some of this in our, in our coding here. And uh, find my ABAP editor. All right, so we're talking about our vehicle definition. And we'll put some of both of these in here just to illustrate this. So we're going to have a public section. And then I'll go ahead and put this in. After the public section, we'll have a private section. Notice that there is no end section or end public or anything like that. The public section just ends when I hit the keywords private section. And the private section ends when I hit the statement end class. All right. so. Um, we said that one of the things that we could have in here would be a, a type statement. So, so let's put a type statement in here. And let's assume that my vehicle is going to have a driver. And so I want to create a type that would contain driver information. So I'm going to define something called uh, a driver struct. And my driver struct will, will have within it a name which we'll say is type string, and then the driver has, and I have my syntax wrong here. This should be a comma. The driver has a name, the driver has an age, and the driver has a, I don't know, what else, a gender type, uh, what should we use for gender? been a while, this should not be a hard question. Yeah, C. And to be explicit, you know, I'll just, you know, length one, this will be M or F for male or female. And then um, let's do one more, years driving. Years driving, type I, and, and that's it. So then this is going to be end of driver struct, okay? So I've just created now a type definition that exists just within my vehicle object or my vehicle class. So uh, there's an example of a type statement. I I'm not going to put in 
a constant, although you know we could create a constant here if we wanted to. But I am going to think about, okay, what, what attributes does my vehicle need? Well, I've already hinted to the fact that I, I'm going to have a driver. So I'll do data driver type driver struct. And I'm in the public section here. So uh, for right now, just to illustrate this, I'm going to make that guy just totally public. He's just out there visible to the world, which 99.99% .99 of the time, this is a mistake, okay? But I'm just going to illustrate it here to show you uh, how this would work. And then um, what else do we want to add here? It's a vehicle, so I'll do color, type, string, and, and what I would more typically expect to see is this designated as read only. Okay, so I've got a driver, I've got a color. Um, we'll use the example I did a moment ago, number uh, of wheels. I don't need number of wheels, I'll just put wheels. Type I. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we'll make this read only. And then in my private section, now here I could have another type definition if I needed one. I could also create some attributes that would be simply, now these are going to be private to the class here. So uh, just to illustrate this, we'll, we'll make some private attributes here. And we'll, we'll create one here called data um, MPG for miles per gallon, and we'll make that type. Uh, we'll make it I. We'll assume we only represent miles per gallon and whole numbers, okay? Now, I can't say read only here, okay? Let, let's see what, in fact, happens if I try and do this, see if it, if it complains about that being a, a syntax problem, um, and it does. Read only is only allowed for public attributes. So, you know, there's our principle there. I can use read only up here but everything in the private section is, is automatically protected, okay? So this is what the definition of attributes look like in the context of ABAP objects. We just put all of these in our definition section. Questions about any of this? So, methods. In the definition, we also have our methods defined. In the class definition, the method definition indicates the methods interface. And remember, as I've said now probably four or five times, when I say interface here, I'm talking about parameter passing. So let's talk about how parameter passing works in the context of, of ABAP objects. We have typical parameters, things that you pass to a method, and perhaps things that will be used to pass data back to you. And then we also have return types. The idea here, remember, is you can, in other programming languages, you can write a method, or sometimes it's called a function, that returns a single value. And you can do that by way of a return type. And let me just illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, maybe, for example, you've written um, programs like this in the past, or code like this, where x equals the square root of, of 7. Okay, And in this situation, 7 is a value being passed to the square root function or method, and this is going to do the math, and then it's going to pass back a value. And it's just going to pass back one value, and because it's passing it back to you in this method, you can store it directly in a variable by putting a variable, putting the call to the method or the function on the right side of an equal sign. Similarly, in most programming languages, you could do something like this, print, 
the square root of 7. And that's going to result in the square root of 7 being calculated and then just printed on the screen. And what actually happens here is this at runtime is just going to be replaced by a number because you're going to call that particular function or method pass it a value and it passes back a value that then gets used in the context of wherever it's being called in the program. So we see those two same options available to us in the context of our ABAP objects program. Although the actual syntax here I'm quite sure is different than anything you've seen in other programming languages. Just like we just talked about with attributes, methods can be public or private. Now we said that most attributes are either going to be private or they're going to be public read-only. Methods, on the other hand, the vast majority of methods are going to be public. You may see a private method, but the idea there is a private method can only be called by other methods in this class. So it's a helper method that can't be called or used by anything external to the object, which is this point right here. A private method may only be called from within another method of the class. So you might write a class definition that has 20 methods, and all 20 of them might be public. And that's not an indication that you're doing something wrong but it's just an indication that private methods are far less commonly used in object-oriented programming in general. Okay, so let's talk about parameter passing. In a lot of programming languages, we just define parameters very loosely. We define the type of the parameter, and, and that's about it. We might write a particular method or function or um, whatever terminology is used in a given language. And we might say, for example, that this particular method takes in four integers. And so we've defined the fact that there are going to be four values and they're all of type integer. Well, in ABOP, what we have is a little bit more definition around this. We have parameters that are of kind importing. So let's talk about what it means if a parameter is an importing parameter. This means that this is going to be used to send data to a particular method. So the data is strictly inbound. It may, in fact, be designated as optional. Or we could have a default value specified. Now let's go back over here to my example I put on the whiteboard and talk about our square root function. And I put here on the whiteboard, and then I crossed it out, so I'll write it again, square root, and I'm passing it the number 7. Do I need to pass my square root function a number for it to work? Yeah, there's no way for a square root function to work without me giving it a number to calculate the square root of. So this would be a very good example of an importing parameter. I'm going to take data, and I'm going to throw it at this particular function, and then it's going to throw back to me another value, but it's going to do that by way of a returning type mechanism. Now let's imagine another method that we had that allowed us, let's say the method was called print name. And in my, in my hypothetical program, this is something that could be used to print someone's name on a fancy certificate. And the idea is we pass this function someone's name, and then it sends to the printer a certificate. So we might say that we want to pass to this a first name, a middle initial, and a last name. Okay. So, you know, this would make sense. We pass it Bob T. Smith, and it's going to result in a certificate being printed made out to Bob T. Smith. But if you also think about this, there are some of these things that, that might be optional. 
like for example the middle initial if the person doesn't have a middle initial you don't want their certificate to look something like this where it just puts nothing there for the initial and then puts a dot after it, that's going to look pretty stupid. You know, you would want to have the ability to have certificates to say either Bob T. Smith or Bob Smith. And so you can understand, I think, pretty readily how in this context, maybe you have to give it a first name and you have to give it a last name, but you don't have to give it a middle initial. Similarly, we could have as one of our parameters here a title. And if the user puts in a title, the certificate would go to maybe Mr. Bob T. Smith. But if title is optional, then it just writes out Bob Smith. If I'm given a title, I work with the title. If I'm not given a title, I, I have code that, that isn't reliant upon that. So I can take a parameter and by designating it as optional, what happens is then if the user elects to pass data in, I use it. If they uh, elect not to give me a value for title or middle initial, it's not going to break my program. The other option we can have is to specify a default value. Now a default value is similar to an optional value, but what it allows us to do is to say if the user doesn't give you a value, then presume this to be the value. So let's say, for example, that I'm, I'm writing this mythical program to print out a certificate, and one part of this is print name, and another part of this might be to print college. And it's, I have to give it the name of the college. Well, maybe this is a program that we've designed here for ETSU. And so the logic of this might be, if the user doesn't give you a college, then assume it's ETSU. So the default value would be ETSU, but this gives the user, by calling this method, the ability to override that. So we'll see uh, more specific examples of this, but I think conceptually it makes sense for us to understand how an importing parameter could be optionally designated as optional, or it could be designated as something that we would have a default value for. The value of the parameter, if it is designated as an importing parameter, may not be changed in the method definition. So in other words, if I say that first name, middle initial, and last name are all importing parameters. I cannot later in my program in the print name method say first name equals Bob because an importing parameter comes to me already set and I can't change that. So this gives me an element of security. And if I even try to write code to change any of those things, if I ever put them on the left side of an equal sign, for example, that's a syntax error. Now, a lot of programming languages, you just pass a variable in. And if the method wants to change it, it can. If the method doesn't want to change it, obviously it doesn't have to. But, but ABAP is a language that officially requires you to designate how you're going to use the data. And an importing parameter is used solely for the sake of the, the caller giving us information and us taking it in and using it, but not in any way changing it. Parameters are passed by reference unless designated passed by value. Okay, so for some of you, this may be, you, uh, you immediately understand what that means, but maybe for some of you, it's been a while since this is a discussion that you've had in a class. What is the difference between pass by reference and pass by value? Pass by value means that we make a copy. And so I have Bob as the value that I want to give for first name. And so when I call the print name method and I say first name equals Bob, Bob gets copied into the parameter. Pass by reference means that we operate on the original. 
and there is no copy. Now you might say, hold on a second, I remember why we do this, and one of the reasons why we do this is in a lot of programming languages, pass by value is how you make sure that the method isn't going to change the parameter, and pass by reference is how you enable it to make a change. Uh, we do pointers and all kinds of fun things like this in other programming languages to accomplish pass by reference. Well, that is not the point of pass by reference and pass by value in ABOP. Because as we just observed, whether or not the method can change it has nothing to do with whether we're using pass by reference or pass by value. If I say it's importing, I can't change it. So the big distinction here is this. Pass by value, I make a copy. Pass by reference, I don't make a copy. I use the original. So why would pass by reference be the default? Because anytime you do pass by value, you have the overhead associated with making a copy of something. Now you might say, well, what's the big deal if I ask a particular method, uh, if I have a, a parameter that holds the user's first name, what's the big deal if it makes a copy of that first name? You know, it's only, it's only 18 characters. Well, you're right in that situation. But suppose I have a method that takes in as a parameter an internal table. Do you want it to make a copy of that internal table just for the sake of doing whatever it needs to do in the guts of, of the method? No. You know, we want to work on the original, which doesn't mean I can change the original because the system's going to keep me from changing it, but it means I'm not going to make a copy. So there are two very important things we have observed to this point, although we haven't seen the code yet, is I have one kind of parameter passing is importing. With importing, I can designate it as being an optional parameter, or I can have a default value specified, and it's going to be passed by reference unless I declare otherwise. So what's the code look like? Well, I have a method, in this case, very um, non-descriptively named method one. And method one takes in an importing parameter. That importing parameter is named var one. Its type is i, so it's an integer, and it's optional. If the user wants to set var one, great. If the user doesn't want to set var one, that's not going to break my code. Here's another importing parameter, var2. This one is passed by value. So I'm going to make a copy of this. And it's type i. Is it optional? No. Don't see the word optional there. Does it have a default value? Nope. Don't see a default value there. Okay. But I now have a method. And here's the rest of my class definition. So let's go back to the class that we have been creating here. And let's play around with this a little bit. So we have a driver, we have a color, and we have a number of wheels. Okay, so let's do this. Um, even though color is public, I am going to need a method if I want to change what that color is. So I'll come up here, and I'm in my public section, but I'm now I'm right underneath this, and so I have the keyword methods, and I'm going to create a method called set color. And set color has one importing parameter. And we'll say importing new color type string, period. Okay. So this tells me that if the user is going to call set color, they're going to have to give me a new color. And, and the type of that's going to be string. All right. And we'll do this. Methods set wheels. Now, Admittedly, what I'm about to show you doesn't make a lot of sense, but I think we would agree 
it's it's not invalid code. Importing new num wheels type i default four. So in this situation, the user calls set wheels and they can say, hey, set the wheels to two. Hey, set the wheels to seven. Set the wheels to four. Or they can just call set wheels and not give me any data and that will result in the number of wheels being set to four. Okay? So once again, just to reiterate this, when I use default, it's kind of like the word optional is implied because the user doesn't have to actually set a value here. Well, let's do one more example of this. Methods set driver. And this one's going to be a little bit more complicated because I'm going to be importing. Um, and let's just work on, on um, what the values are going to be and then we'll turn our attention to the other things. I want to take in a name and then I want to import um, an age and then I want to import a gender and then I want to import a year's driving. Okay, so now I have to go back in and name will be of type string and age will be of type I and gender will be of type C and years driving will be of type I. And now I have to go back in, and this is the way I handle a lot of times. Now I go back and say, okay, do I want any of these to be optional or default? Well, let's assume that in our program, I could have a vehicle that I don't know the name of the driver. So what we could do is we could make the default here um, name unknown. And then for age, we could make this just totally optional. It gives us an age grade. If they don't, that's fine. Gender, we can say that this will be optional too. You know, I'm not going to say it defaults to one gender or the other. We just make it optional. And then years driving, um, we'll just say, just for the sake of illustrating it, that this defaults, that, that this is um, not optional and there is no default value. We're going to have to be told how many years the user's been driving as a part of doing this, okay? And so let me save this and see if there are any questions. But, but keep in mind what, I'm, what I've picked up here in value, in, or I've picked up is the, the caller can give me four distinct pieces and can elect not to give me some of those. If I say driver struct, then it's either going to, I'm going to have to say the whole driver struct is optional or the whole driver struct is required and my logic would be a little bit different. But yeah, I could have multiple set driver methods that would operate differently and the other one could take in a structure. And we can, we can illustrate that at some point in, in our discussion here. Notice here, now I'm getting an error, uh, implementation is missing. Implementation is missing, not missing. Sorry to have uh, lisped there. Uh, but so that's a syntax error just because I haven't finished writing my code here. But everything is valid. Now let me just call a couple things to your attention. We start with the keywords methods, plural. We are going to see later on method singular show up someplace else in our code. So we have the keyword methods, the name of the method. Notice no period here. And in fact, no period shows up until the end of the statement. And you'll also notice there's no comma between my, my different listing of, of importing parameters here. Okay? Questions. So we have to decide, obviously, the name of our parameter, the type of the parameter, and whether it's required, optional, or will have a default value. We have other mechanisms for parameter passing. Exporting. An exporting parameter uh, 
gives us a way to send data back to the caller by way of copying values into parameters. Exporting parameters are always optional by default. The intent is for the incoming value of the parameter not to be used. But this is not enforced by the system, which seems weird. But it's the way it works. Now, let, let's talk, and this is one of the things that's very easy to get confused about. So let's make sure we understand this. And I'm going to employ some of the artifacts that I have sitting here at the front of the room that I have no idea why half of this stuff is up here. Okay? So the idea is if I use returning parameters, which we haven't done yet, but we're familiar with the concept of a method being able to return something. A method can only return one thing. So if I'm a method, I can only give back one thing to whoever called me by way of returning a value. That's what's going on here with my square root function. You call the square root function, you pass it one piece of data, it always passes you back just one thing. That's the only way this can work. What I used to love in, in Pascal, Pascal would call these functions. A function was always something that gave back one value, and methods work differently. We have that concept, but other programming languages just tend to use generic methods for both, generic names for both of them. But the idea is that a, a method can only return one thing. Well, what if you want to call a particular method and not get one thing back from it, but get three things back from it? Well, there's no way for it to pass back three things using a, a typical returning method. Imagine if my square root function returned three things. How am I going to stuff all of that into the x like I'm trying to do there? It's not going to work. So what exporting allows me to do is say to a given method, OK, I'm going to give you some data by way of the importing parameters, perhaps. And then you need to give me back three pieces of data. But since you can't do that by way of returning, I'm going to give you some exporting parameters for you to set for me. And so you can set whatever this thing is in one of the, in one of the exporting parameters. And this can be a second exporting parameter. This can be a third exporting parameter. And this will give you a way to return three pieces of data to me. So exporting parameters give us a way to get data out of a method by way of parameter passing. Now, this is not a great example because I'm only exporting one result. But let me show you an example of what I might be talking about here and using our sample code. Let's assume that I want to create a method called getDriverInfo. So I'm going to add methods getDriverInfo. And in fact, what I don't want to do is return the structure. What I want to return to the user is I want to allow them to get from me the name, the age, the gender, and the years driving as four distinct data objects. So I can do this. Methods get driver info, exporting, name, type string, age, type I, gender, type C, years driving, type I. So what's going to happen now is when I call get driver info, I'm going to have to give it four variables. And it's going to set the driver's name in one of those variables. It's going to set the age in a second one. It's going to set the gender in a third and it's going to set the years driving in a fourth. But here's the thing. We observed a moment ago that exporting parameters are always optional. So the user could do this. The user could call get driver info and just pass me a variable for their name and their gender because they don't care about the age and they don't care about the number of years driving. 
and I'll just set the variable for name and gender. Or they could call get driver info and just pass me a data object to set for years driving, in which case I'll set it to the appropriate number. So I could actually call this method five different ways, one of which would make no sense at all. One way I could call it is to not give it any data objects, which has a do-nothing useful for me, but it would be syntactically valid. The other way I could call it is just pass it a data object for, well, actually, I can call it more than four ways. I can call it, what, 24, 25 different ways? Because I could ask it for a name and just the name. I could ask it for just the age. I could ask it for just the gender. I could ask it for just the years driving. I could ask it for the name and age. I could ask it for the name and gender. I could ask it for the name and the years driving. Or I could ask it for the age and the gender, or the age and the years driving, or the gender and the years driving, or the name, age, gender, name, age, years driving, age, you get the point here. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways I can call this now, but the point is, all of those are optional. So I can call this method, but because I needed to give me back more than one thing, I'm going to have to give it data objects to fill up with data. And so I'll show you how to call it probably next time we get together, but this is the way I would create a method that sends data back to me. And the key thing I want you to remember is I use exporting when I want to get data back from a method and it's more than one piece of data. Anytime I need to get back more than one piece of data, I have to use exporting parameters. Question so far? All right, well, let's look at one more slide here, and then we will call it the end for the day. I have changing. Changing is a parameter that gets passed to a method and it can be changed or not changed, depending upon what it is that my method's going to do. It may be designated as optional, and it may have a default value specified. So you've seen this in programs you've written before. Sometimes you pass it a variable, and it changes it for you. The classic example of that would be a swap method, that you pass it two variables, and it swaps the values of those two variables for you. You could write that in ABOP very easily, and both of those parameters would be changing because the variable is going to come in set to one thing, and it's going to leave set to something else, presumably. So we have three different kinds of parameter passing in ABOP. We have importing, which means data in, but it's kind of like a roach motel. It's not going to be able to change it. We have exporting, which means I give it a data object, and it's just going to use that to send data back to me. It's going to ignore whatever might be in that data object when it first arrives. It's basically like me sending it a box for it to fill with stuff. And then changing, which is mean I'm going to send it a box with stuff in it, and it's going to send me a box with stuff in it that may be different than what I sent it. Well, this is what goes in the definition section of our class. Let's do one example of this. Let's add a new attribute. Let's add a new attribute to my vehicle. So I'll go back up here to my attributes list and I'm going to add the attribute um, um, gas type, uh, let's make this a packed number, type P, length two, decimals one. Now I have no idea. Ah, thank you. All right, so this is going to give me the ability to declare how much gas is in the car, okay? So now I'm going to add a new method here methods add gas only one s add gas and this is going to changing amount of gas type p all right so what's going to happen here and we won't see this until we write the code I'm going to pass in the fact that I just added five gallons. 
and it's going to pass back to me in that same data object the amount of gas that's in the car. So I might pass it a 5, and it passes back 17.2. So I know that means, okay, there's 17.2 gallons of gas currently in the car. Okay? So I'm going to use one data object for the sake of sending data to it, and then it's going to change that value and send it back to me. This is where we will stop for today, and we'll look at how we actually work with this then next time. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and I'll look forward to seeing you on Thursday. If you didn't get a chance to sign in, uh, please make sure you do that before you head out.